Welcome to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast, addressing all aspects of the digital enterprise, inspiring connection without boundaries and creation without limits. Thank you for tuning in. Here are your hosts, Tom Singer and Craig Brown. Hello there, and welcome to, or welcome back to, the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Thank you so much for coming along on this journey of this show that has been designed to be a resource for those who work in and around PLM. The Digital Enterprise Society, it is a forum for the exchange of ideas surrounding the tools, processes, and practices used across the product life cycle. To learn more, visit digitalenterprisesociety.org. My name is Tom Singer, and I have the honor to co-host this show along with Craig Brown, an industry veteran and former PLM leader at General Motors. Hey, Craig, how are you today? I'm great, Tom. It's uh, good to be doing another one of these. And uh, we have a repeat guest today, and we're talking about the impacts of, of working remotely. And so this will be, be interesting to get their insight. Absolutely. And today's show is one of those sponsored shows. Today's episode is sponsored by Vertex. Vertex Software's cloud-based digital twin platform it fuels team collaboration by unlocking 3D data and providing aligned visuals across engineering, procurement, manufacturing, sales, marketing, service, and the supply chain. Every single week, Craig and I try to bring to this podcast interesting interviews uh, and other ideas that are going to help listeners enhance and grow their careers. And today is going to be one of those shows. So today we have with us Matt Hine from Vertex. Hey, Matt, welcome to the show. Hey, Tom. Glad to be here. Hey, Craig. Uh, nice to see, see you. Again. Tom. So, Matt, I don't read bios. I like people to introduce themselves. <laughs> so, why don't you go ahead and, and tell everybody kind of who you are, what you do, and, uh, and we'll go from there. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, my name's Matt Hine. I lead uh, product at Vertex. Um, I've been in... Um, the software space for 15 years. Before that, I was a mechanical engineer um, working in grad school on uh, manufacturing visualization, uh, large-scale CAD uh, visualization. And um, so I've kind of had my feet in both sides of uh, um, what Vertex does, which is basically cloud-based um, visualization for digital twins. Hey, Matt, it's good to hear your voice. Um... As some of our listeners know, you and I have uh, been conspiring for about the last year. And um, this current crisis we're facing with um, staying at home, working at home, um, I think brings to, to mind the technologies that you guys are developing. And partly because you're, you're able to take what was maybe a manual or certainly a, a, a process where people had to get together, um, largely due to technology and maybe just due to practice. And now all of a sudden, they're not allowed to be together physically. Um, tell, us, tell us how Vertex is helping address that challenge. Yeah, so if you, if you think about um, your typical um, manufacturer, you have um, a lot of work coming out of design engineering where there's a collaboration um, you know, between engineers themselves, their supply chain, um, teams on manufacturing, you know, hopefully they're doing some design for manufacturing, design for assembly type analysis. So, you know, really, you know, if you think about it, des design is a, a very collaborative um, process. And where Vertex is, is helping with that is, um, you know, traditionally it's been very hard to share um, engineering data um, mm -hmm. amongst all those groups. And so we're really focused on making that uh, simple and easy, um, you know, think through like, you know, everyone's got a mobile phone today. Now, now um, you know, everyone's not necessarily at their desk doing work. So how do we help facilitate um, design where you are and keep that uh, design moving? Yeah, one, one of the things that surprised me in my, my former life at General Motors is as we did more virtual engineering, we literally had conference rooms set up um, as a, a virtual war room, if you will. And sometimes there were stuff posted on the wall, uh, maybe current manufacturing status or whatever. And then somebody would run a high-end workstation, which had access to the secret repository. 
And then whatever the chief engineer or the design reviewers wanted to see, they would throw it up on a, a screen that was attached to the workstation. There's a lot of compute hardware to make that work. And, and nowadays, uh, I mean, we didn't move these computers to homes and, and you're right that the handheld device is more powerful than those workstations. It's just interesting. So, so the, how, how can you get the, the collaboration that occurs in a room of experts who somebody's driving a display um, with something that's now um, tied to your phone where you're, or, where you're working from home or maybe you're working from your own personal laptop? Yeah, I mean, you know, if you if you think about that, imagine collaborating on a on a document um, where only one person could put that document up, and everyone's like making changes to only what's being like viewed on the screen, right? Like, the, people don't work like that. People don't um, hmm. collaborate that way. I, and I think you know, oftentimes, I'll I'll still see this where someone will share their screen so that. Um, they can show you what they're seeing at the same time everyone else is looking at a different angle of you know that document or in the case of manufacturers um, the CAD model or looking at a different aspect of it um, analyzing it from a different perspective you're all talking about the same thing but you're you're exploring that uh, interactively together and I think um, you know this this model where only an engineer has a machine powerful enough to pull up <laughs> Um, one of these designs and only the software license just for that. There's all kinds of people like I was listing before that are a part of that process that don't have access to those tools. So how do we, how do we enable them um, so that th those engineers can get the feedback that they need to make, um, to improve the design and um, ship the design, right? Well, now, now they, yeah, <laughs> for all the wrong reasons, maybe. They didn't have access to the tools because maybe they were working for a company that didn't want to pay for that many workstations and, and the related sure. licenses. Or, or maybe it's an outdated license model. That, that's my view. Because <laughs> uh, I've worked with enough different companies now to see other license models where it's not tied to hardware, but rather it's tied to usage, kind of like a utility, right? If you use a kilowatt, you pay for a kilowatt. Um, so I, I think that's an interesting um, challenge. It's made even worse now that you cannot go to the office, at least, at least in certain states, the state I'm, I'm residing in. Well, we're still uh, strongly encouraged to not be in the office. Now that's going to change in a few weeks, it looks like. But what have we done in the last eight weeks while we've been in this situation, right? And I think, I think cloud-based things are really attractive because, I, A, I'm used to them. I do my banking that way. I, I do some other things that way. And because I do some pretty important things in a secure way, then it would seem to me like cloud-based um, applications would be the way to go. This is one of the things that that I found you guys were, <laughs> you're leading the charge, right? And, and what I think is interesting is those engineering firms have been sometimes reluctant because they're worried about security, which I, I yeah. think might've been on a, it's a valid argument, but but candidly, it's this bigger argument about, well, but I want everybody in the room so I can look around at faces when, when we're trying to make a choice and, and you know, uh, have a review that way. So I guess I got a couple, couple points. You guys yeah. are clearly not tied to a machine. You're in the cloud. Let, let's remind everybody a little bit about that. And then my second point is, is can that, that guy who wanted everybody in the room, can they still do the, the review the way they want to do it, but now virtually, whether it's Zooming or something else. Um, please describe those two points, cloud and what's, yeah. what is the remote platform like? You know, it, it is interesting, I think, um, you know, with, with some other industries outside of manufacturing um, that I've been a part of, you, you've seen uh, um, early adopters to the cloud. I would um, not consider manufacturing to be laggards, but they're, they're probably kind of waiting. Um, they're, I would say the late majority, they're waiting for everyone else to figure this out because they, they probably have the most complex data. It's the hardest data to um, try to uh, render and represent. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that um, Vertex has done is we've, we've kind of flipped the model on its head here. Instead of you passing around that, that data to every machine, 
um, we centrally store that data and just render what what you need to. And when when I talk through this with you know a, a customer or potential customer or someone's uh, security team, you know the the first reaction is to oh no like we we can't put that data in the cloud. That's <laughs> that, that's our most pre- valuable asset, and that that is absolutely right. Um, but then as soon as I start asking a few questions um, with their security people in the room about how they're doing this today, <laughs> you know, their, their jaws kind of drop like, what, wait, what, how are you doing that? Yeah. And, um, and, and when I start talking to the security person about, well, now, you know, we can tap into your um, cloud identity provider. So that's um, for everyone, you know, think uh, SSO is, or SAML uh, comes mm-hmm. up. That's the way that your security team um, controls who accesses their system so we can you know integrate with that so that that gives them peace of mind um, they understand that we're not moving data around we're, we're just si- simply rendering an image in the cloud and, and sending that to you so that there's no real IP transfer there and then you know lastly we we have the ability for an IT person to um, see a complete audit trail activity history of everything that's happening. So, you know, if, if someone opens up a sensitive model in a region of the world that you aren't expecting, um, they can right. be alerted to that. But, yeah. you know, if, if, if you're just using the traditional way of passing files around, like who, who knows like what happens to that file once, once it's out. Well, and that, so that's think, a really good point. And it, it happens all the time. It's, it's the human weakness and the sneak path out of the company. And that, Right. You're right. Your your approach is going to make that much more uh, robust. Um, maybe they can send a picture, but they can't send the stuff, the real stuff, right? <clears throat> yeah, and so I think when we get when once we get to, um, like I said, I think the the end user initially they're like, no, like our 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 IT people will never allow that. But then once we talk to the IT person, they see all the advantages of it. So you know, as long as we can. Um, get the IT person on board and the security people on board, which actually, you know, they're already procuring software that does this in other areas. And so <laughs> they're, they're, they're already used to this. The, the manufacturing business users um, probably don't even realize that that's happening. And so it's, it's really interesting dynamic when we start talking to an IT team. Now, now let's go to the design review. So, sure. so in that, screen I described or that conference room, you're kind of stuck with one view or maybe you got a couple screens so you get two views. And what you described earlier should really help the design review where multiple people could interact with the same view. So the, the, the point of view, the, the way you can see something is actually driven by the consumer, the person that, that's holding the handheld device, even though you're all interacting with the same exact design. So that that's, that's got to help a chief engineer because now different people can look at it from different points of view, right? Yeah. And, you know, like, um, like we're talking about earlier, you know, everyone has their different perspective on that design. Mm -hmm. Um, You're, you know, maybe you're, um, you know, you're looking for part reuse. And so you're, you're bringing that lens to it or you're bringing, um, you know, from a platform perspective, um, you know, how can I, give this um this design as many options and um you know extensibility so everyone's bringing a different perspective to that design review and you know just thinking that you can accomplish that by only one person sharing one screen and one view Mm -hmm. and one filter of that and be able to accomplish what you need I, i think is it's a little crazy um and by the way and then this also allows you to have kind of asynchronous re- reviews. So we're talking well, about everyone being yeah. in the room at the same time. Like if, if your team's distributed across the time zones um, or, um, you know, they, they can't make that time, but they still want to give their feedback. Like, how do you, how do you do that? Well, I, it's funny. I'm remembering my past, right? I mean, no kidding. We used to have groups of people that did time architecture. I'm not making this up. We, we literally followed rules around the world you're having a meeting with Asia, you, you met at, you know, either 7 p.m. or 6 a.m., right? Yeah. <laughs> so it was, was uh, anyways, um, yeah, that should go away. You know, if, if people know, well, your feedback's due within 24 hours, then any time in that 24 hours, they, they could do it. In fact, 
if, if, if you and I were in different time zones and we wanted to talk about a common issue we saw, we could collaborate in real time and just, just get with it without waiting on the other dozen people to be there, right? Absolutely. There's so, there are so many efficiencies there. And instead of, you know, having a war room for eight hours, maybe everyone can drop in their feedback and then you can only like and yeah. start cycling through that and then get everyone in the room for a half hour, um, you know, for a synchronous meeting. Which, which would be much better time architecture, time usage. So, Absolutely. so, so here we are, we're, we're challenged with, we can't go into the office and now we're going to discover that there's better ways of working. Um, because technologies like yours exist. Um, a lot of people are talking about, oh, when are we gonna go back to the old normal? And some other folks, and I suspect you're one of them, are saying, well, why would we? Why, why do we need to go back to the old normal? Maybe we're defining a new normal. What, what are your thoughts about that? And what are you seeing happen? Yeah, so, you know, as, um, as we're starting to see some of these patterns emerge, um, some of this is very custom, um, customary to people in my world and in the software world where we've already been um, working distributedly for the past 15 years where, um, you know, working from home um, or uh, flexible work from home hours, like is just a perk. And actually, you know, what, what I find at least with um, software engineers, and I'm I'm sure this extends to other uh, creative knowledge work professionals is that, you know, these open plan, uh, open offices are not conducive to actually getting work done. And, <laughs> and, Bravo. and most, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> and, 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 and most people would prefer to just have a quiet spot um, to work. And, you know, there's, there's some things like if, if I'm working on a difficult problem, you know, I might want to keep working on that past five, right? But, yeah. you, you know, so there's, there's all kinds of advantages there and so i th- i think you know the i think if, if you look at the trends we're already kind of heading in that direction for the for the knowledge workers i think this just accelerates that um what i think the the real disruption will be is for the for the non-knowledge workers and so you yeah. know the jobs that um you can't do by yourself at a desk where it's that where that's actually an advantage it's a it's a disadvantage to you yeah and i i, I think though they all They'll figure out a new balance. I mean, they. Um, um, one of my close associates is uh, he's a welder by trade, right? But he's also an instructor at a community college, and so they've been going through this challenge of how to how to do a lot of what they teach, um, you know, virtually now. Well, that's great until you get to the actual point of showing somebody how to weld two metal plates together, which which you need to do in a lab, right? And so. Right. Um, the laboratory will still exist and the laboratory will now be set up for physical distancing. And, and, um, you know, as we get through the fall, they'll, they'll figure out how to do that all better. Um, so, so have you thought much or do you have a, a maybe a, a client or two that are, are talking about a hybrid environment where they can do work the way they used to, but now they're taking an advantage of, of, of the vertex platform and things like that? Any, any uh, if you will, use cases coming from the field and maybe they came faster thanks to COVID? Yeah, I mean, one, one area that's, that has been interesting for us in the last um, six weeks here that I, um, I, I wouldn't have expected um, is the, the training use case that, that um, hmm. we're just talking about. It's, you know, there, there is some aspect of welding that could be taught um, not by doing, but, you know, as, as a former uh, big TIG welder myself, you know, you, you do a lot of bad welds before you get to the point where you're good. And Mm -hmm. um, I remember hearing someone say like the the best welders um, sometimes age out when their hearing starts to go because. um, Oh, they can't hear the crackle. (laughs) Yeah, you're right. That's, that's, that's kind of how, you know, you've got a good weld, right? So there's a lot of that that can't be, um, taught in a virtual environment but there's there's plenty of things that that can be um we we've got a customer that does um um, a lot of inspection and verification um type type things and you know instead of flying their field engineers in to get on-site training like how Mm -hmm. come they couldn't uh deliver that curriculum remotely um 
there's also the case, um, you know, you with your automotive background, you know, think about um, dealer training. Um, oh yeah, right. And and you know, dealer technicians flying in. Um, is is there a way to deliver some of that training uh, remotely? Mm-hmm. And you know, just assembly, disassembly, repair type um, type use cases. I I think, you know, obviously you still need to be on site to do a repair. Um, but there's all at, there's all kinds of aspects of your job where you don't necessarily need to to be there, right? Well, yeah, and, and you know the car companies um, are slowly rolling out, at least here in the United States. Um, they'll come to your house and do service, right? And so having the service book instead of you know three feet of paper. Now most of them are electronic now, anyways. But but to have that on a tablet that they could quickly pull up and. Uh, you know, explore and better yet, explore what other people are experiencing uh, with the same kind of a service problem. Um, yeah. That would be pretty cool. And if they could just come to my house, well, then that's even better. Now, it doesn't help the sales guy who wants you to go in a showroom and take a look at the, but yeah. just, just think this through. But then why wouldn't you have your app come up on the customer's phone and say, well, while we're waiting and while we're fixing your car, here here's the latest and greatest new product. Let's take it for a virtual drive, right? I mean, I got to believe people will do this, right? Yeah. And, you know, Craig, as, as we've talked before, you know, um, I, I own a, um, a 2015 Model S. And, you know, at, at the time I was living in Virginia where, um, you know, they had a law where you, you can't um, purchase a vehicle directly um, at right. a showroom. Right. Got to go through a franchise or else. Right. Right. And, and so, Elon challenged all that. Good for him. <laughs> right. So, you know, what was interesting is, you know, I, I could actually, they, they, Tesla had a showroom that I could go and I could test drive a car, but um, there wasn't a salesperson there. It was, it's merely as a, as a test drive. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, thinking about the auto dealer, is, is there a way that you can still have that customer do the test drive in a, in a safe way? Um, do you know, they they can do every other aspect of that sales process online, just like I'm buying a, a, a computer or a phone. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, on the service side of things, I, I recently had a um, uh, uh, main battery uh, coolant pump failure. And um, I started just getting these error messages um, saying, um, you know, a uh, car may not restart. It was, it was kind of vague. Um, and I was like, okay, that's interesting. Um, what but, does it mean to but, start a battery driven car? Never mind. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, I don't um, want to take you in the ditch, but whatever. I'm so pretty sure it was not I a was, spark plug. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, let me, let me, let me drive home um, and see if it does restart. And, and it did. And then maybe like the third time it, it, the warning got a little bit more aggressive and said that um, top speed has been reduced and some other things. And so I was like, okay, let, let me, let me call hmm. someone. Well, you don't call, like you use the app and, and you request a service time. And, and like you were saying, they, they come out to where you're at and um, all of the, um, the whole experience was through the app. And, and actually uh, they knew what the issue was before they even got to my car because of IOT and all these other things. And so they mm-hmm. knew exactly what the failure was. They knew what they would need to replace. They knew the configuration of my car. So the, um, the uh, Tesla road vehicle comes out um, wherever I'm at. And I, I, I happen to be in a parking lot um, of, a, of a Panera or something like that. And, you know, he fixes the car in the parking lot. Interesting. And so then, um, you know, he, he showed, you know, he, he, he said, well, you don't have to watch me do this. You can go home or, you know, go back into Panera or whatever. Um, and then, you know, he sends me uh, pictures of what he's doing and then um, uh, says, I'm done. What do you want me to do? And I'm like, well, I'll just leave the key in the car. And, and, and that's it. And, mm-hmm. you know, that, that was all the billing uh, took place through the mobile app. It was, it was great. And so I would expect every auto manufacturer is going to yeah. move to that type of experience. Yeah, so, the, so COVID is going to make us, or, or any pandemic, would make us really question maybe our physical um, surroundings, including the physical places we do business, right? You're, you're right. We software companies, we, we prefer quiet places to do our thinking work. And sometimes we found that was at the home or library or wherever. 
Um, but these open office environments, uh, it was not the place. <laughs> and, and even, you know, some of the knowledge that maybe a, a service technician would get from his peer in the other bay. Well, again, with, with, with a little bit of record keeping and, and experience, um, it can all be in their database and now it's available in their app. And, you know, it's at least software as a service, right? That, that Tesla's counting on to make that all work with whatever apps on their phone. Um, you know, whether that's a public cloud or a private cloud, it's still cloud technology. That's what enabled that. And if he found something unique and some other Model S customer was finding a similar problem, he would benefit from your service call that afternoon. It, it, he wouldn't be waiting for s <laughs> three months, six months until the service manual got updated, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think, um, you know, we're, we're working with some auto manufacturers that are, you know, aggregating all that information, mm. feeding that back into the system and, and coming up with, you know, I think traditionally we think of digital twins where you got the um, IoT performance data flowing in, you know, you think about the, the G gen mm -hmm. engine and the, but there's also other digital twins, and one of them, you know, is a is a quality defect digital twin right. where I can bring in all of that um, that data. Then maybe also, you know, pull in some of the performance data, and I can get a more understanding of what's happening. And do I need to, you know, what do I need to change in the next version of this car, or is there is there something that I need to do in this current version of the car? Yeah, right? one one of the interesting things in the automotive history is is fuel quality. And, and the, the countries where fuel quality was consistent, and I'm not saying good or bad, I'm just saying consistent, right? Sure. Versus countries like the United States where uh, the fuel quality varies a lot across the country. And so you, you, it took a while in the old world, how do you figure out why products were, you know, misperforming in certain regions of the country and not other regions of the country, right? And, and it really was this usage patterns like you're talking about, and also regional, right? What's different, right? From humidity to, to driving patterns to whatever. In the past, that was all done by armies of analysts over months of time. Well, now the army of analysts is becoming machine learning, and uh, the overtime has become an IoT, meaning you just, you just collect it even faster because you can collect it in real time. In the past, you'd actually, we used to instrument, you know, 100 vehicles across the country and try to collect data. Well, now the data is collected almost for free, either because it was regulated or, or because it's convenient to, right? Um, right? You know, Tesla makes no secret. They're collecting all kinds of, not, not just performance data, but also, you know, how, how are you as a customer using the day, using the product? And, you know, that helps them make Absolutely. a better product. So, yeah, I, IoT and cloud and remote computing, they're all here to stay. And it's interesting to me how, how fast it's changing. Um, what, do you, what do you think? You think people will go back to the old way of doing a design review? Or do you think they're just gonna do them like we are right now from our, our preferred <laughs> desk, wherever we are? <laughs> well, I, I think it just comes back to like, um, what type of design review am I doing? Um, and do I need to um, actually be be there in the office to do that design mm -hmm. review and and i and i think there's there's still plenty of use cases like we we had a customer that was working you know um on uh npi and they've got um you know a, a prototype of a machine that they um mm -hmm. were about to move into production and you know to do a live design review you know you still want to be able to do um walk around and inspect um that sure. machine if, if for nothing else this the weld points <laughs> to make hey, sure they look yeah <laughs> right yeah um so and again everyone's you know but w w one interesting thing that happened with that customer is like they're, they're starting to do um you know it's it's not augmented reality but it's it's sort of like a a, a digital and an analog together where they've got yeah. the virtual machine on their phone they're walking around the actual machine, um, you know, taking photos, um, dropping pins and markup and showing, you know, on the virtual machine um, where, where there's potential issue, but using the live machine as, um, as the specimen, right? Yeah. And so that, that way you get, um, you know, otherwise I think, you know, you would use sticky notes or I, I'm not, I'm not even sure what, maybe you could give us some tricks on how to, how to do that without a phone, but. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I think contextual navigation, right? Uh, and, yeah. and if it's the physical product, even better, right? Uh, 
let it drive the the discussion and then let the computer applications you know do the sticky notes and all the rest um it i know as a as a chief i have a bunch of of young talented engineers maybe some not so young all working in parallel it'd be really cool to see the four or five design reviews that happen in parallel for different for different topics in the same context and say, oh, well, how's my overall program? Am I going to make it or do I sure. have so many right. hot zones that I'm going to have to, you know, uh, do something different? And I, I think especially if you get a disruption to the market like it's happening right now, well, sometimes these are blessings, right? You get a little bit of time, you can go back and fix some hot zones that maybe you didn't think you had time to fix and you're just going to work around them, right? So I, I think yeah. a chief would love to see these multiple reviews in the context of the physical product. I, I think it would be really, really powerful. Now, I'm remembering your comment about you have to experience the weld so you can hear a bad weld. You know, with all the gaming technology and, and everything with, with sound and motion and er I mean, come on, you guys can do this. Come on, right? Come on, add, <laughs> add, add the soundtrack, add, add the, you know, and even, I bet you this one's harder. You know, soundtrack we can probably do because we're we're experiencing it right now. But how about smell? Can you smell a bad weld? <laughs> the, the gas uh, it's given off. <laughs> you know? No, I mean, yeah. If I if I remember right, you could definitely smell like right. uh, that. I didn't have enough, um, you know, argon flowing through or whatever right. um, in the gas you had. But you don't know, have to work on the smell. But <laughs> but you know, there's there's all the different senses and. Um, and again, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that we're going to be a completely virtual digital world in, in the future. I, I think um, the, the current times with the pandemic are just going to accelerate some of these trends that we've already started to see um, and, and get people to rethink how they're doing business and, um, you know, prepare for, prepare for the future and prepare for business continuity. Um, if we see, you know, future pandemics. Well, we're going to, for this one, we're going to see future waves. Oh, this, this isn't right. going to go away in a month or two. Right. So, right. so get ready. And then I, I like your summary because this, if people thought that technology didn't exist, that, you know, what you and I have been talking about is over the horizon and not available, well, they couldn't be more wrong. It's here. People are using it. Um, some early adopters are doing it for their own reasons that had nothing to do with working at home. But now that they have it, um, it enables other things. And then I, I think travel, uh, especially getting on a plane and going across country, uh, you know, I expect people, more people will drive now, frankly. But but I don't know that that anybody wants to go to a place where there's hundreds of people that, you know, 50% of them are misbehaving, right? So so I I think new normal is is going to be there. And, and yeah, physical properties will still be built, especially if you're in a business that sells them, right? But how much can you do through platforms like the Vertex platform, um, I think is, is really key. And so um, those of you listening out there, we've, we've been talking for a few weeks now about the impacts to business. Well, here's an enabler that would let you come up with a new way of doing work. And, and um, you might even find out it's faster because you don't have to wait for everybody to get to some place. Um, so what do you want us to watch for, Matt, in the next quarter or so? What are we going to get from you guys that would be really even more amazing? Yeah, one of the um, things that we're starting to see from our customer base is that, you know, we, we have um, an application that helps facilitate, facilitate design collaboration between, you know, within your engineering team and also outside of your engineering team with um, your supply chain or procurement or manufacturing. But right. we're also starting to get a lot of traction with um, our platform, which is essentially is the, the thing that we use to build our application. A lot of large OEMs and partners are saying, mm -hmm. I like that application that you're building, but how are you doing that? Can I have that? Yeah. Can I have the and glue? So, so I can glue in my yeah, stuff, right? Like, I, yeah. like, you know, I, as I, you know, we're, all engineers. So the way I think about it is the, the Lego analogy. I've got the here's the here's the thing that you can build with the thing on the front of the box. And then at least when I was a kid, you could flip around the box to the back and see all the thing other things that you can build with it. And so that's what we've started to um, start to offer is um, all the Lego blocks. So you can say, hey, I've, I'm already building um, this experience for my customers to let's say you know going back to the sales use case, um, configure price quote, um, uh, 
a machine or a car or something. Um, right now it's just static geometry or that takes like a lot mm-hmm. of work to get to that spot. What if like, could I just put up the engineering data and have people configure their car using our engineering data that we already have? Like, so we're, we're starting to get um, seeing those types of um, engagements where we can uh, expose our Lego bricks to um, help IT teams that are already trying to build something else within a manufacturer. You know, you're reminding me of a, a, a different terrible exact uh, accident a few years ago with, with the tsunami in Japan. And what you're describing, there were groups of people in the automotive industry, it wasn't unique to any one company, who all of a sudden had to figure out how not to use parts from that region of the world. And so they were talking to new suppliers to replace the existing supplier. Um, and it, it was pretty amazing. That was largely human effort putting PowerPoint pictures on walls, amazingly. Now, this was you know a long time ago uh, and <laughs> relative to events. But this time around, you would say, oh, no, 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 we don't have to do that. We just need to set up a story and share it with our potential supplier and and even our past supplier who still wants business it's just that their plants in the wrong location well with covid i could just imagine this oh yeah 80 percent of my parts come from asia whoops we don't want parts from asia anymore we want parts from the americas or or the region of the world not experiencing a a wave of infection right so it it'll be interesting i i, I think there are use cases that will become really prevalent that really need that that you know Lego block approach to building solutions. It may not be engineering at all. It might be all these other functions of the company that just, in context, want to see uh, uh, the knowledge, you know, like location of part manufacturer <laughs> in the picture of a three D drawing, right? You know, sh- show me that in the context of my assembly. Oh, yeah, it, it's 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 really interesting. You know, you you talk to the engineers and they say, oh yeah, like. Um, you know, yeah, we talked to the service team and, you know, we, we helped them out. But if you go and talk to the service team, they're like, no, we've been asking for this data for years and we can't get it. Right? <laughs> well, yeah, we don't want to share and it so, with them because it's not ready yet, right? <laughs> for some stupid yeah, reason right, like that. Yeah. Right. yeah, it's like, well, that design's always changing. It's like, right. yeah. <laughs> so, there, yeah, you're, you're right. There's, um, there's all kinds of you know, supply chains are going to be um, realigned and refactored here. Yeah, you're going to lot. see, mm. you're going to see um, new ways of us um, building things um, more locally um, that are strategic for, you know, certain purposes. And so I, you know, I, I think there's going to be, um, you know, and, you know, unfortunately, you know, this has been, you know, really devastating in terms of the economy and uh, people's lives and everything. Um, but, you know, it, I think that there there can be some good that comes out of this and, and help us um, prepare for the future and accelerate to um, where we need to be. Yeah, you know, and the, the quality of life, um, you know, two things I've observed. One, well, first, I don't have to commute again, so that, that's kind of cool. Now, that was partly my choice to retire, but the people that have not been commuting for the past eight weeks, they've got a couple more hours, at least if you live in a city, you got a couple more hours on your hands. So that's kind of a cool thing. And then just just what's happening around us in the environment, from lack of congestion to a little bit clearer air to, to these kind of things. Well, I think the new normal, if I could do 80% of my job the way we are today, we're, we're in three physical sites and we're, we're having this conversation, I, I think people will start to say, well, that's okay. You know, and the, the manager who insists on, on seeing people's faces, they, they just got to get used to the idea of, of seeing people's results and and you know yeah the rest of this will get easier <laughs> so but um, you know that's that you bring up a good point Craig one one thing I read this morning and I I, I can't remember the source but the the study was that sixty percent of people that um, are working from home now don't want to go back to the office mm, and, that's insightful yeah and you know seventy five percent said that they would um, only want to occasionally go back in in case there there was something that they need to be there for right right and and so you know i think i think there will be um some some shifts and you know if if i'm an it department i I need to start thinking through that and you know one thing i'll say to the to the managers you know uh, in, in in this uh article um 
and and you know i've i've heard this from from other people it's like well how do i know that they're doing work like you know if, if you have to stop by someone's desk to like witness them in the act of doing work then like that's probably the wrong way to ensure um responsibility and accountability of getting things done um mm -hmm. and that's and true. so uh <laughs> you know i i think um there's gonna i'll, I'll say this after um me myself working um, remotely um, with with teams, uh, distributed teams for the past fifteen years. Um, your 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 best people, like you'll you'll know who's who's getting things done and who's not, and you know who's communicating uh, well. And this will just shine a light on you know on this. And I and I think that there will be an adjustment. Um, I had to like when I first started doing this, I had to make some adjustments myself to ensure that like I had a good um, location to get work done that I wasn't being um, distracted mm -hmm. and I, I think you know I what I what I tell to software engineers that I that I hire or de um, software designers I don't care where you, like work isn't where you um, go it's what you do right and so it doesn't matter where where you are like as long as the the work's getting done and we're mm -hmm. meeting our objectives and goals then you know i don't i i shouldn't care that you work at a desk um an hour from your home from nine to five like like you're saying that's that i in, in many ways that's anti-productive right yeah so and and yet so much of problem solving today is at least in big companies it's this open office environment to encourage collaboration well it seems to me we've, we've got another way to do that and it's it's what you guys have developed and uh yep. you know Matt, I enjoyed chatting with you always. I hope our audience has enjoyed it. And uh, Tom's telling me I'm going a little long, so now I got to <laughs> hand it back to Tom. <laughs> so, so Matt, uh, if somebody wants to find out more about Vertex, how do they find you guys? Yeah, if you um, go to our website, um, it's vertexviz, uh, V-I-S dot com. Um, you can find out more. Um, we're... Um, there should be a, a contact form on there. Um, you can also find me on uh, LinkedIn. I'd be happy to talk about all these subjects and more. Nice. Well, thank you again for, for being here. And thank you to Vertex for sponsoring this episode. Uh, everybody, please join us next week when we'll bring you more thoughts, ideas, and information in and around product, <clears throat> product lifecycle management. The Digital Enterprise Society, it is the place for the exchange of ideas around digital manufacturing tools. Check us out at digitalenterprisesociety.org. You've been listening to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Learn more about what you've heard here today at digitalenterprisesociety.org. Join us again next week for more Connection Without Boundaries and Creation Without Limits.